I think that uh, like my definition of marketing uh, hasn't really changed. I think it's just a matter of everyone else catching up. Uh, and I think this is actually, it's an important point and it's a big problem because people keep making up very broad definitions of it to suit their own narrow interests. Uh, and actually I steal my definition from a, a scholar named Tim Ambler, uh, a, a professor over in London. And, uh, and I'd say marketing is the management of inbound revenue. Uh, so, so it's less about the things that we do and, uh, and you know, a kind of, you know, branding and imagery and all that to the extent that those things are relevant for the management of inbound revenue and cash flow, then great. Yeah. But, but it really is about bringing money in. <laughs> That's what marketing is all about. Uh, and then all the tactics that help us do that. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of the CVO Live. Uh, I'm here with Professor Peter Fader. Hello there. Hey. A bit of uh, intro. Peter Fader is a professor of marketing at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania and director and co-founder at TITA. He is an expert in customer lifetime value, a dear topic to, to me and to us over here. Behavior data analysis and customer-based corporate uh, valuation. One more thing, he won multiple awards for his research and teaching and the two of his most popular books are Customer Centricity and the Customer Centricity Playbook. Professor Feder, welcome to the CVO Live. All right, it's always great to chat with you. I, I, I love all the things that you and your team are doing over there. And I'm happy to help spread the good word about customer evaluation. Perfection, let's do that. So Professor Feder, the first question that I have for you is what is marketing nowadays? What, what do you think is marketing anymore? Well, I think that uh, like my definition of marketing uh, hasn't really changed. I think it's just a matter of everyone else catching up. Uh, and I think this is actually, it's an important point and it's a big problem because people keep making up very broad definitions of it to suit their own narrow interests. Uh, and actually I steal my definition from a, a scholar named Tim Ambler, uh, a, a professor over in London. And, uh, and I'd say marketing is the management of inbound revenue. Uh, so, so it's less about the things that we do and, uh, and you know, a kind of, you know, branding and imagery and all that to the extent that those things are relevant for the management of inbound revenue and cash flow, then great. Yeah. But, but it really is about bringing money in. <laughs> That's what marketing is all about. Uh, and then all the tactics that help us do that. Fantastic. And where is the uh, customer lifetime value getting into, into the picture? Well, and, and, and that's where, where that's why almost why I choose that definition, because mm -hmm. uh, instead of just saying, uh, you know, what, what product would be most appealing or, you know, what, what message will people find most funny? Uh, we want to say, what activities do we do that's going to bring in you know, the most revenue over uh, over a reasonable time frame? What, what activities we do are going to have the highest net present value? And of course, customer lifetime value is just the net present value of individual customers. So mm -hmm. it, it's kind of a natural way to look at things. It's just that in the past, uh, it was just impossible. We just wouldn't have the data to be able to do it. We didn't have the analytical capabilities to leverage that data, nor did we have the tactical capabilities to do anything about it. Uh, but today we do, uh, and there's really no excuse not to look at things that way. Yeah, I uh, I've watched your uh, your uh, your input to the whole industry, and you've been one of the first voices that uh, were trying to to shift the the focus towards what matters uh, in uh, uh, in a company's uh, activities. And uh, well, actually, how, let me jump in, Valentin, because I think it's an important point. I appreciate the credit, but it's not true. <laughs> it's not true. Maybe I shout louder than other people. Maybe I somehow get people to pay attention. But uh, and I don't mean this in any kind of false humility. I mean it sincerely. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, uh, both practitioners and academics. 
who actually laid out a lot of these ideas for decades before I even had any, any clue about them. So part of my mission is to give credit where it's due and to say, actually, a lot of these practices and even the methodologies that were out there in the, the 70s and 80s and some, some even before that, it's just that no one paid attention. They were, they were either ignored, they were dismissed, uh, or they just didn't have the right kind of data, analytical skills, or motivations to kind of uh, get more people to pay attention. So a lot of these ideas aren't new. It's yeah. just that a lot of people are stumbling into them for the first time. Then let's say that you have the credit of, uh, let's say, uh, translating those into more more easier to, to understand the concepts. And I'll take credit for that, trying to make these methods uh, more appealing, uh, more interesting, more fun. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm good at doing that kind of thing. But, but uh, and, I'm, you know, and I'm not bad at coming up with some of this stuff either, but I'm not the, the, the first or the only. Yeah, that's uh, that's right. How you've uh, t- tell us uh, if you go down the memory lane, how how you first uh, uh, realized the importance of customer lifetime value in business. You know, it's really funny because I had a, a, a lot of exposure to it before I realized the importance of it. So back, uh, so I, I've been on the Wharton faculty for 35 years. I started in 1987, and back then it was actually doing, I was thinking about the world in a very conventional way. You know, it's all about the product. It's all about the brand. Here's the thing. Who can we sell it to? Uh, Very much along those lines. Um, But uh, a couple of things happened in the mid nineties. Number one, some of my students pushed me to go outside of my comfort zone that uh, originally I did almost all of my work in the packaged goods space. I did a lot of work with IRI and Nielsen and just really focusing just on Procter & Gamble and Kraft and Unilever and, and, and Nestle and, and these kinds of companies. For me, that's all I wanted, that's all I needed. I believed that the patterns of their customers, that the uh, managerial issues they faced were unique to them. Uh, but some of my students pushed me to say, hey, can you apply some of those methods and concepts to other industries? Like what about the music industry? What about electric utilities? What about professional sports? And so out of curiosity, I started to take the methods and apply them elsewhere and and it worked. So that was kind of one transformation. Number two was my wife, (laughs) that she at this time, excuse me, um, worked for a company called the Franklin Mint, which many of the folks listening probably aren't aware of, but they're actually one of the original old school direct marketers. Uh, and, and really viewing the world the right way, which is, hey, we have these really valuable customers over here. What is it that we should be developing and selling to them? Taking the usual marketing perspective and flipping it around, figuring out who the valuable customers are and using that to drive product innovation, marketing activities, and so on. So she'd come back from work and say, hey, there's this thing called customer lifetime value and RFM segmentation, all this stuff. And I go, that's nice. I don't care. I'm busy <laughs> helping all these packaged goods companies, you know, sell more kids' juice drinks. Um, but but it did plant a seed. Uh, and then the third thing, actually, uh, there's four things. The third thing would be the dot com revolution. <clears throat> Again, late '90s, when all of a sudden, very rich behavioral data is becoming available in a way we couldn't imagine before. And finally, the fourth thing was the academic reviewers who got tired of a lot of my work on new product forecasting and said, can't you do something different? I mean, really, are you gonna write the same paper over and over again? Um, And so I just did this, along with Bruce Hardy at the London Business School, did this 90 degree pivot. So instead of using these methods to say, how many people will buy the product? To ask the question, for this customer, how many times will they buy the product? The methods still work really, really well. But that ended up being a question that was new and sexy and interesting and tied in with all these other revelations that I had had. So I really didn't stumble into it till the early 2000s. I was already a professor here for 15 years. But for the 20 years since then, it's been just amazing. And and every day we're still getting more people to wake up to these ideas and finding more use cases for them. Uh, And and it's been it's been great. It's getting better all the time. I, uh, I bet it was quite, quite a ride. Do, do you think that right now people are, uh, if, from my perspective, 
uh, people are starting to wake up to the new reality where good old principles like customer lifetime value should be considered and could be leveraged. But from your pers- perspective, is the adoption where it should be? Uh, the the uh, instinctive answer for me is, is to say no, because <laughs> once we, again, stumbled into it and started refining the models and the managerial narrative around them, that was 20 years ago. Um, so on, on one hand, you know, everybody should be, you know, lining up outside my door, say, you know, work with me next. Uh, and not just me, but you and, you know, others who are out there, you know, getting mm-hmm. the, the, the good word out. Um, so on, on one hand, um, it's, it's not as widespread as it should be. But on the other hand, the momentum is really strong. And, uh, and given the frustrations that I was feeling about this stuff 15 years ago, I look at where we are today and, and the progress we've made and, and how many companies are lining up outside the door and the variety of those companies. Now, I'm glad to say more about that. Um, uh, so we're in a pretty good place now. But the, the realization is that this kind of change is fairly significant. And so it's not one that can happen overnight. It's really more of a generational change. And so I'm actually feeling really good that when the next generation of leaders take over, you know, when, when, when my kids, my, my students, whomever become CEOs, they're going to be doing the right thing. But it's really hard for today's leaders who were born on yesterday's marketing um, for them to just to make a switch like that. More of them are paying attention, uh, but this kind of change takes time. And I've really come to realize that uh, you need to be patient You need to uh, uh, convince people not just to take the tool and run with it, but to help them really understand and appreciate it. And and again, that doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Can you please help uh, people which are watching this, either executives, either entrepreneurs, either from big companies or uh, smaller companies, why customer lifetime value matters and how they can leverage it in uh, in their companies? So I, I come at it from lots of different directions, primarily the marketing one, which is you, you're going to do a marketing campaign. I, I, actually, th- this is a story I, I've, I've stolen from one of my favorite people, Zachary Anderson, who used to be the chief uh, data and al- analytics officer at Electronic Arts, the gaming company. Um, he's now in that same role at NatWest Bank uh, over in the UK. Uh, and Zach uh, basically said this, suppose we develop a new game. Uh, And we sell a bunch of copies of it, but it's to a bunch of people who never bought from us before and never buy from us again. So regardless of how many copies that game we sold, how much lasting value have we created for the company? Whereas maybe we come up with a game uh, and it takes a lot of our existing customers and gets them to stay around longer, buy more from us. We don't need to sell as many copies of the game. But if it can help lock in the right kinds of customers uh, and we'll have them you know, do more with us, maybe, maybe not even with this game, but, but other kinds of, of, of you know, revenue generating activities that they might do with us, then the second game, even if it's sold fewer copies, is actually better. So, so we wanna think of the long run. We wanna think of the products we sell, not as you know, ends onto themselves. Let's sell as much of this product as possible. The products are just a mechanism that helps us pull in long-term value from customers. And there's no better metric to measure that than customer lifetime value. It's much more useful. Again, I'm not saying that looking at product sales is a bad thing, uh, but it's not necessarily as indicative of the long-run health of the customer base or the company. Whereas lifetime value is very closely aligned with future revenue projections and so on. So from a marketing standpoint, Let's focus on creating and extracting value from customers. It's kind of obvious you know, to you and to anyone listening here, uh, but to other companies who are still product obsessed, it takes time. The other angle that I come from, is especially with the new company that I'm running now, Theta, is from the finance one. That if we do want to live and die by revenue projections or free cash flow projections, then there's no better way to do that than to look at customer metrics. How many customers are we going to acquire? How long are they going to stay with us? How often are they going to purchase? How much are they going to spend? Uh, and, and so there's, those are not only the underlying ingredients for overall company revenue, but for lifetime value. 
And so, so overall company revenue and lifetime value, are, they, 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 they blend beautifully together. And if we want the folks in finance to respect the folks in marketing and vice versa, we need to choose metrics and, and, and data and language where the alignment exists. And I think CLV is a wonderful bridge between the two. Fantastic. And I couldn't agree more. I, uh, I've been wasting some years of my life trying to do forecast and budgeting by simply coming with, up with assumptions, which were only guesses, you know, how much we are going to get uh, next year, what's, what's the growth rate. And we were simply tweaking those, uh, those numbers in Excel when I, back in my good old days when I've been a younger entrepreneur, and almost never we, we got it right. But once we started to look at the customer lifetime value, segmenting our database, it, it was fantastic for us to, to share a bit of, story, of background story from my end. We realized that I was selling online car insurance at that moment. And we looked at, at the data and we realized, hey, the best customers are either truck drivers, either luxury car owners. Let's focus on that. And that, that changed dramatically the, the way we, we, we done marketing and eventually led us into profitability after four years of struggle. Exactly. Once you see it, once you look at the world that way, you can't stop. Uh, and then you look at everyone else who's just saying, we have the product, you know, who can we sell it to, regardless of their long-term value to us? And you just realize how wrong it was. That was the frustration that I was feeling, you know, 15 years ago. And that's why I started writing books and founding companies, trying to find every way to get people to, to pay attention. Uh, but, I, I, you know, given your own experience, again, I'm not the only one out there. I, I love stories like yours where people discover this stuff on their own, where all of a sudden they just look at things a little bit differently and they realize, whoa, that's the right way to go. And, and I know you and I, we're just trying to form kind of a, a whole international army of people who, who look at things that way. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're getting there. We're, we're making progress. That's right. Uh, I, I want to... I want to address a topic which is uh, kind of uh, interesting now in, uh, in the uh, in the debates on LinkedIn, which is uh, uh, which is from my perspective a, a, a strange interpretation of how customer retention and customer lifetime value works. There is this uh, manifesto from uh, uh, Byron Sharp around how brands grow and. Uh, I personally think that many people get it wrong, but uh, and, and in a nutshell, I think you know what's all about. It's uh, just add new customers. Yeah, I mean the interpretation is just add new customers in the in your marketing machine, and uh, things are going to get uh, to 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 go well for you as a brand. What's your take on this uh, perspective? So it, it, a lot of people find it surprising. I might take on it. Uh, it turns out that I'm actually a, a huge believer and supporter of most of the things. Uh, that, that Byron says. Uh, I, his, his mentor, Andrew Ehrenberg, who is re really, he is one of the giants upon whose shoulders yep. I stand. Uh, he would, really was the first one back starting in the late 1950s to look at the basic patterns of customer behavior and say, there's something systematic here. There's something surprisingly consistent across brands, across sectors, across segments. Uh, and a lot of the models that Andrew Ehrenberg first popularized are the same models that, that lie at the, at the foundation of what I do. So there's actually very strong connections there, but I'm not willing to just kind of stop with some of the say 1960s style models that, that Ehrenberg pointed to and that Byron you know, basically has uh, kind of draws the line at saying we can actually do better. The kinds of data that we have available to us today, again, the kinds of analytical skills, the kinds of questions that we're asking. So I, I spent a great deal of time in the 1990s when I was kind of waking up, um, basically adding some slight bells and whistles to some of those original fundamental models. Andrew Ehrenberg would fly me across the ocean to yell at me. He'd say, you can't mess with it, okay? This, this is the gospel truth. If you start doing other things with it, people will get confused, they'll lose the message. And I'm saying, Andrew, 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 uh, I'm agreeing with 95% of what you're saying and the other 5% is wrong and I can prove it. Um, so I actually really do agree with, with most of what they do. Uh, most of their advice, most of the patterns that they point to, double jeopardy, duplication of purchase, a lot of that stuff is just absolutely right. Uh, and even that suggestion about uh, the, the, the prime role of acquisition 
I even agree with that. But the twist is this. For Byron, uh, it's mostly purely about quantity of acquisition. We want to grow the footprint as large as possible. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but I'm saying that in addition to quantity, <clears throat> we also should be looking at quality. Byron is the first to acknowledge that not all customers are created equal. He's just willing to kind of live with it and say, that's just the way it is. I'm saying we can leverage it. And then recognizing that some of those customers are kind of just born awesome. Um, we should be focusing some of our acquisition efforts to acquire more of those kinds of customers. Doesn't mean that we should be doing all of that, only that. We still need to acquire broadly, as Byron suggests, but we should taking some of our dollars, actually a disproportionate number of our dollars to be identifying and reeling in those really good customers. So it's just another layer that I add on top of a Byron's perspective. Uh, and one that I think makes a really big difference. That's, uh, that's absolutely right. And I, I think uh, it's music to my ears because uh, many people in marketing think that uh, customer retention, CLV is like a given, is like gravity. You can't, you can't mess around with that, but you actually can improve it. You can increase it. You can shift your focus a bit to the right customers. And let me give you another example. It was uh, five years ago. One of our customers, a large shoe retailer here in Europe, they were having a huge competition. Everything was a mess for them. They, they wanted to acquire new customers and they wanted to invest a few millions in TV, their first TV campaign. And with the, uh, I, I was working with their CMO and, and with the CEO of, the, uh, of that company, pretty large company, uh, a few uh, hundreds of uh, uh, more than 1 million customers. And we, we said, let's look at, to whom should we be focusing? And they've said, yeah, we know who's the best customer. There are ladies in their thirties. How do you know that? Because we've got this research from JFK and we, we do know. And I, I started to argue with them. And anyways, I, I got the CMO on my side. We've started to do a research. We looked at their own data. We applied the RFM segmentation. And then we look at the uh, this geographical distribution of their best customers and surprise. And uh, the, the surprise was that most of their uh, best customers were coming from smaller cities where they haven't got these large shopping malls. And based on that, they, they, they've twisted their uh, marketing campaigns and it was a huge success for, for the company. So basically I have this proof that you can acquire the right customers from the very beginning, if you do research and if you do your homework. So I love that kind of story. And really that was the most gratifying part of, of my first company is already at, because we would do exactly the same thing. So all these companies, it's, it's almost exactly the same story. All these companies knew that their best customers were millennials or whatever. And we'd say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let, let, let's look at the data over here and find out that they're actually not what you think. Uh, and to see them say, whoa, uh, and, and then to take advantage of it and make more money and to see that happen over and over and over again. And every time it's just so gratifying to see the company you know, wake up and, and to see the individuals in that company realize, wait a minute, this is the way we should be working instead. Uh, and then to have them go to other companies and talk to their friends. And, uh, and so there's, it's, it's so wonderful to see that kind of story, but again, it's also frustrating that these stories are still more exception than rule, but yeah. we're getting there. It's, it's okay. Yeah, bit by bit, baby steps. Uh, I want to ask you something regarding uh, RFM segmentation. Can you, can you explain in a bit how uh, retailers could leverage that? And I, I'm asking you this because there are many companies which are not in the B2B space. They had unknown customers until they got into the digital channels. They suddenly woke up to the fact that, hey, we have data and we can use it and see the patterns and anomalies. And But how they can leverage RFM segmentation now they, that they have known customers through their loyalty sure, fees and so on. Sure, sure, sure. So uh, one of the problems is that companies are now being flooded with data and they just don't know which numbers to look at. Uh, and so whether it's looking at transaction logs and even then there's just so much behavioral information we get extract from who bought what when, but they're also looking at social media, you know, clicks and likes and looking at ratings and reviews 
and they're looking at geolocation data, you know, who was where, when. They're looking at, at, at psychometric data, bio information. The people are just being flooded with data. And that's what leads to a lot of the data mining, a lot of the machine learning. And those are powerful techniques, but only if you know how to direct them. And so, so a lot of retailers just waking up to this flood of data uh, are going to the bits of data that are just most interesting to them, but not necessarily the most predictive or diagnostic. So things like ratings and reviews. Again, I'm not saying that that's bad data, but it's not necessarily the best data. Uh, but, but to them, that relates to their ego. Do people like us or not? Let's really focus on that. No. Whereas on the other hand, if you think about RFM, recency, frequency, monetary value, um, I've never seen a company that when they put together their data dashboard, that they'll have any recency metrics. They might use RFM segmentation, sure. But if they're looking at their customer base as a whole, show me the distribution of recency and show me how it's been changing over time. Show me how this new cohort, uh, how their recencies compare at a similar tenure point to, to our older cohorts. Uh, and no one looks at that. Um, even though our forefathers in direct marketing told us 50 years ago that RFM, and again, starting with recency, is so incredibly predictive. Uh, and so again, it's great that companies now have the opportunity to, to leverage some of those insights, but they don't make it quite as high a priority as they should. Uh, and, and even if they do, uh, even if they use RFM segmentation, uh, they're not necessarily gonna make it the single or the primary basis for segmentation. They're still gonna be doing things like personas. We're still gonna break our, our customers up into different kinds of personalities. And oh, there's Carpool Carla, and there's Working Wanda, and there's Busy Betty, because that's just much sexier than RFM. So they might do RFM for you know, one kind of activity or another, but they don't make it the, the, the main basis for evaluating their marketing decisions and making new ones. Um, but at least they now have the capabilities for it. You and I, we just need to educate them to make RFM job one instead of just one of many different things that they look at. That's right. In, in terms of the RFM, can you, can you also tell us what's the, uh, if there are some, let's say, rules regarding number of segments that you should be having? Because you, I, I've seen that there are uh, two extremes, either big companies with only four RFM segments, which don't have the affinities between them yeah they they, they they buckle them all up over there they put it in the same bucket either on the other end of the spectrum we have uh, i don't know scales from one to six for uh, companies which are having only i don't know fifty thousand customers which are uh, uh, they have two granular data it, that's are there cool. any are there yes, any yes. rules there that's a great point because if you go back to again our forefathers in direct marketing who first gave us the rfm rubric, uh, the conventional way that they did it would be to use quintiles. So we're going to have a five by five by five. We're going to have 125 different segments. Now for them, it, was, it wasn't really segmentation the way that most marketers think about it. And this is where the problem arises. For them, they, they weren't really thinking very carefully about each of those 125 it was just kind of a convenient way to use for, for testing. So, hey, we're going to launch this new, new product over here. Um, let's just see which kinds of customers respond best. And then, you know, out of the 125 R times F times M groups, and then we'll kind of double down on those groups. Mm -hmm. So it was just a way, it was more of a screening device than it was as segmentation. Because exactly to your point, we don't want to have too many segments because it just becomes too cumbersome to come up with unique messaging for each one and to track each one and they get too small. Um, and, and so uh, what, what I'd rather do is in a lot of my work is I don't really use RFM segmentation at all. I mean, I, 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 I like to use it as a way to view data, but I don't use it as a way to, to kind of drive decisioning. Instead, I'll use RFM as the data inputs and then I'll run my statistical models on top of RFM to then come up with everyone's lifetime value. And then very simply, again, RFM is a kind of a means towards an end. Once I have 
lifetime value, which embodies our F and M, but but is does it more holistically and does it more predictively? Yeah. Uh, then I'll take my RFM, my, sorry, my CLV groups, and then break them up into let's just say five, maybe ten groups, deciles, highest value to lowest value customers. So again, I'll use RFM to get the CLVs, but then I'll make most of the decisions on the CLVs themselves. Perfect. Uh, can you also share with us uh, if you have uh, any any story about uh, how a company leveraged the RFM in in a practical manner? It can be any kind of uh, of company. I'm sure you have a lot of uh, uh, experience over here. Oh, I have, I have too many stories to tell. Uh, <laughs> and in fact, one of them is, is is very similar to the story you told a few minutes ago. Uh, it was actually a, a women's accessory company and just kind of teaching them to pivot away from you know, demographic targeting and into more behavioral based targeting. And just, just w- wonderful to see the immediate impact that it had. Uh, and wonderful to see the way that they on their own kind of changed their internal, not just their internal metrics and scorecards, but corporate culture uh, to think along these lines. Uh, so it's so many stories. Uh, one of my favorite ones Um, I I mentioned uh, earlier, I I love to do some work in professional sports uh, because, you know, I'm a big sports fan myself. And I look at the way a lot of those organizations are run, putting aside what they're doing on the playing field, the way they run the business is really ineffective. Um, And so a few years ago, Major League Baseball came to me to ask a very specific question about uh, about secondary ticketing, you know, people who resell tickets. Uh, and I said, oh, look, I'm, I'm happy to help you. But your questions about that one issue uh, are, are too narrow. They're too limited. If you, really want to, if you really want to understand this issue, you need to understand the full range of issues, the full range of problems you're having. Things like loyalty programs or lack thereof. Things like dynamic pricing or your unwillingness to use it. Things like this. But basically, let's think of, of the wider variety of things that sports teams can be doing to become more customer centric. Yeah. Uh, and, and basically said, if you're willing to go for the, the big broad ride, then I'm going to work with you. But if you want to just work with this one narrow issue, I have better things to do. And it was great to see them say, yeah, let's do it all. And here we are 10 years later. And it's just amazing to see how many professional sports teams in the US and Europe, elsewhere, um, are actually starting to run their businesses more effectively, thinking about the lifetime value of fans instead of how can we get as many people into the arena as possible? Uh, and so, again, very gratifying when it's a sector that I care about uh, starting to operate uh, in a much smarter way. Yeah, I have a very technical question, which uh, is nowadays uh, a hot topic, at least in the e-commerce arena, where the the customer acquisition costs are going through the roof thanks to uh, or because of the iOS 15 update, cookie, uh, co- the cookie-less future that it's uh, coming to us and so on. Uh, there is this debate around the ROAS or marketing efficiency ratio and whatever. And on the other hand, is the CLV to CAC ratio and the CAC payback uh, period, which of course I'm uh, a more fan of. Uh, and also there are these debates uh, around where the ratio should be from CLV to CAC ratio. Do, do you have any, any take on this? Oh, so there's actually three or four issues bundled yeah. into that, that excellent question. So. Uh, so let me start at the beginning, and then we'll get into yeah. all the metrics. Um, I'm obviously not a fan uh, of the iOS limitations, or for that matter, of things like GDPR and, and legislation that just makes it harder for companies to get the, the kind of data that they need to, to run most effectively. But at the same time, I understand where these limitations are coming from, which is to say a lot of companies have been and still are doing a lot of really dumb things that, that by, by putting cookies everywhere and by, by trying to overdo a lot of the personalization, that's what starts to creep out people and get regulators worried and, and have companies like Apple start putting restrictions on. So I think a lot of those restrictions arise because of the kind of dumb things that companies have done that I wish that companies would, would think first, Let, let's really think about what we should be doing with the data before taking all of this personalization technology and going crazy with it. 
So a lot of the, 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 the personalized, highly targeted, targeted advertising does not work. It's very ineffective. It's very inefficient. Uh, and so I've been trying to get the company to say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, slow down, slow down. Let's walk before we can run because we want to spend our money as effectively as possible. And we want to try to keep those, those legislators off our back. So if we can do things in a smart way, if we can be very, very careful about which uh, personal elements we choose to use and which ones we should just ignore, um, I, I think we would have had a different path. Um, so, so, so part of it, I think a, a lot of the, the problems that companies are facing, it's their own fault for going too far too fast. You know, I spent a lot of my career as an academic asking this question almost for fun, as much as they do it for practical reasons. How little data do we need? How little data do we need from a given customer um, or across customers in order to make pretty good predictions? So it's, for me, it's been kind of a fun game. Can I tie one hand behind my back and still make pretty good forecasts? And you know, what's the, what, which data should we be looking at and what's the math to, to kind of turn those data into forecasts? Love doing that, that kind of thing. And it turns out now all of a sudden it's really relevant. All of a sudden companies are having one hand tied behind their back. Uh, and so they need to use whatever data they can get much more effectively. And they need to be much more choosy about uh, 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 what they're gonna do. Um, so, in, so in some ways, well, again, I'm not happy about it. It might bring in the kind of discipline that, first of all, force companies to slow down and also force them to start thinking more carefully about the models and the behavior instead of just dwelling and obsessing over the data too much. So, so I have a, you know, kind of an interesting, uh, almost surprising perspective on a lot of these data limitations. And then the, the next part of the question is, is, is thinking about what benchmarks we should be using to gauge success. You know, so LTV to CAC or ROAS. And one of the things that really bothers me is that companies will choose models based on what metrics they're aiming for. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I like lifetime value. And I like, again, the, 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 the metrics that are one level below lifetime value. How long is the customer gonna stay? How often are they gonna buy? How much are they gonna spend? And I wanna use those metrics to drive all of the decisions that we make. So I don't wanna be choosing between ROAS and uh, LTV to CAC. I wanna be basically say, let's agree on what data we're looking at, what models we're gonna build. And once we have that, that core foundation, we can spin off of it any one of those objectives, you know, including payback period. Uh, and yeah. so, so, so we can argue about you know, which metrics to go with. Uh, and, and obviously the answer is it depends. But I don't want to argue about how we do the calculations to get those metrics. I want to be able to seamlessly move from ROAS to payback to LTV to CAC, but knowing that we're at least measuring them uh, or, or, the, or the, you know, the data and models underneath them are, are, are being used consistently. Uh, so, that my, so my bigger concern isn't the difference across those objectives, but just the, the, the different ways that we approach them. Yeah, I I also have a question regarding the the the, the a topic which is way too complicated to cover properly here. Just for the sake of uh, of touching it, though, uh, is CLV should CLV and value means revenue, gross margin, or net margin? Because that that's changing dramatically, and I've been having these debates with some CFOs, and I. I want to, I want to have your opinion. That's a great point, and and it's been a real education for me personally. That when I started doing a lot of this work, uh, I was uh, almost exclusively focusing on revenue, uh, and I would downplay costs. I'd say, oh yeah, take the costs out too, but I didn't really, uh, I, I didn't say it as strongly as I should, nor did I give any advice about how to calculate those costs. Uh, so a lot of my older work is actually. Um, not helpful in this regard, because again, it, it plays down margins and just plays up revenue. Um, meeting Dan McCarthy, uh, my former PhD student, my collaborator and my co-founder, was, was such a, a great uh, education for me because he said, if we're gonna win over the, the, the credibility of accounting and finance and all the people outside of marketing, 
Um, we need to be just as careful about the costs as we are about the revenues. We need to think very carefully about margins. We can't just make up a number. Um, we, we need to understand where those costs are coming from and how they should be allocated across things like new customer acquisition versus the ongoing retention and development costs. Now, I don't want to say that we have the answers to it. It's, it's kind of interesting that we've become so sophisticated with the CLV model development, being able to predict who's going to do what next. We're great at that now. But our ability to allocate costs is actually really poor. And so it's very important for us to have this conversation with the people in accounting and elsewhere in the organization to be very, very careful about which costs should be fixed versus variable, which ones are gonna to apply to new versus existing customers and to do that in a consistent manner and try to come up with industry standards around it. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're starting to make progress on it, but it's still, it's still lagging way behind our ability to predict the purchasing. And it needs to catch up because if we don't get that right, then our models are potentially misleading. Uh, and so it's, it's really, really, really important to, to focus on costs as much as revenue, even though it's not really my strong suit. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So uh, uh, another question that I, uh, that I have, and thanks for, for clarifying that, uh, uh, even though it's not like a, a recipe that you can, can use, uh, it's, uh, it's way more effective to, to have the clarity behind these uh, numbers because, as I've told you, I had the debate uh, recently with the CFO, which thought that CLV was based on, a, uh, on the fact that the customer retention rate was only 30%. And he said that the customer is spending only three months to, to, to that. But looking at the cohorts, looking at the RFM segments, he, he couldn't debate anymore and he needed to readjust the, the predictions and the entrepreneur the, 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 that, that was behind that company realized that he wasted one year on acquiring market share by being too prudent. And so I think it's a, it's a double-edged uh, sword CLV if you don't measure it, uh, uh, it's not like correctly, but uh, accurately enough. That's a, that's a great point. And let me, let me expand on that because not only must you take costs into account, but even the way that you calculate CLV. You know, I, I, by shouting all the time, CLV, 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 uh, a lot of people will jump right to it uh, and will start using uh, approaches that aren't that good, that aren't that accurate. Uh, and one of the problems with CLV, if, especially if you're talking about CLV, customer lifetime value, it's a long horizon thing. And so, so a lot of people will never quite know if their models are right or not, because they're, they're projecting lifetime value. But then, you know, two years later, they're saying, did the campaign work or not? They don't have the patience for understandable reasons to say, were we calculating lifetime value correctly? So, so there's a lot of bad stuff going on out there. A lot of people who are just making things up or oversimplifying it saying, yeah, no one's going to know the difference. Um, so on the revenue side, as well as the cost side, we need to have higher standards. We need, there needs to be more rigor and accountability for the way we, we do, do these kinds of calculations. As an academic, you know, I, I have really, really high standards, uh, and I just want to convince companies that it's in their best interest to do it right. And it's not that difficult. It's not any harder to do it right than it is to do it wrong. So just do it right in the first place. Yeah. Uh, Professor Feder. You are also involved in uh, TITA. I'm, I've been, uh, of course, uh, following your, uh, your models that you've made with the, with the students around uh, Peloton and around other, other companies. Uh, why, why, why is this company and, uh, and what is the problem that it's uh, solving? Of course, I know, but I want to share with, the, with our audience the, the, the reasoning behind building. Sure, and no, I appreciate the chance to talk about it. So let me actually back up and talk first about the previous company, Zodiac. So yeah. as I mentioned, I kind of stumbled into these models in the early 2000s, refined them, figured out all the use cases, not all, but many of the use cases for them started writing books to try to get people to start waking up and paying attention to them. Uh, but it still wasn't enough to, to, to really get the kind of traction that we need. So in 2015, along with Dan McCarthy and a couple of other former students, we founded Zodiac to bring lifetime value to life at full commercial scale. Let's do it the right way. Let's focus on different use cases. 
uh, and let's get companies to, to change what they're doing. And it worked. It was great. Uh, eventually, Nike bought that company, and that was a wonderful outcome by itself. That provided for there, there are a lot of companies we work with, but there are a lot of others who are kind of skeptical, saying, ah, who, who does this lifetime value thing? But once Nike bought the company, it's like, well, they do, <laughs> then we yeah. should too. So that was a wonderful outcome. Um, but as we were selling the company, um, one of our clients wasn't just a retailer. One of our clients was actually a private equity firm. And they didn't care so much about all the tactical use cases. All they cared about was, can you tell us the lifetime values of all of these customers in this particular company over here and add that up and tell us what the company's worth? Customer-based corporate valuation. So they didn't care about any of the interactive tactical things we were doing. They were just using it to decide which companies to buy and for how much. So as we sold a Zodiac to Nike, this, this one company begged us to try to get a carve out. Can we continue to do that one use case, customer-based corporate valuation? Nike wouldn't care about that. So can Nike give us the permission to do just that? And, we, and they did. And so we started Theta for that purpose, purely for a customer-based corporate valuation. And many private equity firms stepped up, many other investors, many companies said, we think we're undervalued. We think that there's more stickiness, more loyalty, more repeat purchasing here than Wall Street gives us credit for. Can you help us identify it? Can you help us communicate it? So that's what we've been doing at Theta, and it's been great fun. Again, starting with finance in order to get people to understand the models. And here we are four years later since starting Theta, and our non-compete with Nike has expired. And so now we can go back and do all the tactical things as well. So at Theta, we're, we're now in this wonderful position to appeal to the finance people and to appeal to the marketing people to build that bridge across them, to help a private equity firm acquire a company and then help that new portfolio company do the right things. So it's been, been really, really fun uh, to kind of broaden the scope of these kinds of models and to have these companies out there to just do it more effectively because there's only so much that I can do myself. Yeah. I, I, I also have a question regarding the corporate valuation. Uh, we've been seeing this skyrocketing. And uh, I mean, there are all these economic cycles and it's clear that you have these uh, huge multipliers and then suddenly you, are, you turn out to be, I don't know, six times uh, less valuable depending on the, 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 the industry. How, how uh, not how, what is the main reason from your perspective? Because my, from what I look at things, I think the mentality is the main problem. I mean, we, we have this market, which is so greedy and they are jumping into this bandwagon. We have this new company, which has 50 X in revenue when it's listed and they do IPO and then it's uh, whatever. But I think this is a problem, which is mainly related to, to, to mentality and education. What, what's your. Oh, absolutely. Your... There's no data. And the kind of, Good news, maybe bad news for investors, is that we've had such, you know, so many of these companies have come back to earth just over the uh, the, the last couple of months. Yeah. Um, but I, but I, I worry a lot about that because we'll do these valuations. We'll say what the company is actually worth. And until that bubble started forming, what was interesting is about half the time we'd say that the company is overvalued and half the time we'd say the company is undervalued. Uh, and so, so we had no bias in our analysis. It was, it was just we would see value as it is. We would see value in ways that investors might not see it. Uh, and you'd never know for sure before we do the analysis whether this company was going to be you know, a good one or a bad one. But then the bubble starts and we find that every company is overvalued. And so it becomes a lot less fun because, first of all, we know before we do analysis, it's going to be overvalued. But the bigger problem is that investors basically ignore us. They'll basically say, look, you can do your analysis, whatever, but you're missing some intangibles. You're missing some growth factors and some <laughs> whatever. I don't know, they're making things up. And we're saying, no, you're wrong. That because these companies are disclosing the data, how many customers they've acquired and how long they're staying and how often they're buying and how much they're spending. There is no way, there is no way that you can tell a story that it's worth 50x 
given the kind of data that they themselves are revealing to the public markets. There's no way that they can fit together. You know, you, you tell me, Mr. Investor, how these two things could, could reconcile. And they, they, they'll, they kind of get quiet and walk away. Um, so all those valuations are coming back. I mean, a great example is Warby Parker. That's actually the most recent analysis that we did, the, the online glasses company. When they went public in September, we said that they were worth about $22 a share. When they opened, they were selling for $55 a share. And a lot of people were saying, nah, nah, you're wrong. Uh, and I believe yesterday they closed at around $24 a share. So everything is kind of coming right back to where it should be. And yeah. people are starting to really pay attention. Now, having said all that, I have to give the words of caution, which is don't take stock tips from a marketing professor. <laughs> We are not really trying to predict the valuation of a stock because that's up to the crazy psychology of the marketplace like you described. Yeah. All we're trying to do is to predict revenue. So we can tell you what revenue is going to look like. And there should be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the flow of revenue and the stock price. There should be, but there isn't always. So we're going to stick with the revenue numbers because that's something that we can be held accountable for. That's something that's not going to... Um, you know, go through the same kind of ups and downs like stock prices will. Um, but it's still at the same time fun to try to say what is the stock price implications of a particular revenue forecast. Yeah, that's, uh, that I completely uh, agree. And uh, I, uh, I also want to add something re regarding this. Uh, it was like uh, at, at my third company, we we got this meeting with the, with the investors and uh, they gave us like uh, some valuation uh, models you know it was romania eastern europe we were selling online car insurance we were making this we were making something like 8 million in uh, in turnover which was good for our for our country and uh, they 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 came with with these models and we we wanted to know how we are evaluated i mean we we had our ideas and desires my partner thought that we are valuing well we make something like we should be valued at 20 million which was like 2.5 x in uh, in revenue i thought that if they give us 5 million we should take 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 those money and scale it up into the region you know i was way more conservative in in that uh, that perspective uh they gave us something like 2 million and uh, it was a quarter of our revenue, and of course we, of course we, we disregarded their offer uh, eventually. But for us, it was so crazy that we we thought that we are ten times more more valuable than they thought. Uh, and also, one aspect uh, which I want to to touch here is the fact that CLV is uh, yeah, yeah, is also very valuable for for entrepreneurs from smaller companies which are willing to. To, to, to predict what they should be doing with their uh, their companies I had uh, I have an example of uh, a company from Sofia from Bulgaria they expanded in 12 markets their their, their revenue was doubling year over year while their CLV was 30 percent uh, lower year over year so I, I I talked with them I said that hey you have an issue here uh, the company no longer exists but they managed to raise some money. So investor, not all the investors are, are, are looking at those metrics, which I think are so common sense. I mean, it's not that hard to, to look at, uh, at these numbers. Yeah, and it's changing. More and more investors are leading the way. Uh, and uh, again, it's much better than it was a few years back. And I think a lot of the work that, that Dan McCarthy and I have done is, has been uh, instrumental in that regard. And I have to say, um, besides the work that we've done, there's some, some wonderful work being done by a number of different colleagues in Central and Eastern Europe, too. And in many ways, I find that that part of the world, in, in some sense, you have more of a kind of a clean slate over there. Uh, and you could, you could have this, this more opportunities to start, not only to start companies, but to start new kinds of business models. There's more willingness to actually uh, try new approaches and, and a lot of smart people to do the kinds of uh, analytical things that, that are required. So, so I, I'm seeing that a, a lot of this CLV revolution, um, I, I think uh, while it's happening all over the world, I think that some of the very best practices are gonna be emerging from Romania and, and Eastern Europe and the Nordics. And 
Uh, and so that's why I'm keeping my eye on you uh, to, to see, you know, how you're going to help, you know, old line, uh, you know, a, a, a American and, and other Western European countries uh, kind of wake up and start doing these kinds of practices. Yeah, thank you. I, I totally appreciate that, Professor Feder. Uh, one last question that I have for you, which is not from the spectrum of business. You've been, uh, you, you had uh, a lot of uh, experiences. You've been learning a lot. You've been teaching uh, others a lot. What is the uh, lesson, let's say, that you, you it was most dear to you? I mean, if you would be looking at your younger self, what is the lifetime uh, tip that you, you want to share with our audience today? Um, it's going to sound like really boring and technical, but, but for me personally, and what I try to convey to my students is, is just to have just a true appreciation for, for just probabilistic processes. That the, the world, uh, we, we overcomplicate customer behavior and try to tell these very detailed stories about what they're thinking and what they're doing and why. And it turns out that if you view the world just as a series of coin flips, you know, heads, I'll buy the thing, tails, I don't. Um, you know, heads, I'll stick around and continue as a customer, tails, I'll just leave. Um, uh, uh, if, if we can have just a really strong appreciation of probability and the right kinds of distributions that kind of govern customer behavior, uh, it, it, what, what I tell my students on day one of my course is not only do I want to teach you just a bunch of methods that are going to help you, you know, use data more effectively, but I want to change the way you look at life. I want to change the way you look at the world. And so whether it is business, whether it is, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, employee behavior or sports or, 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 uh, or, or even, dare I say, with everything going on over there, you know, military issues, um, and and th th if we can look at things in a probabilistic way, we can just have a strong appreciation for, 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 for prob probability. Um, we, we just can come, come to better grips with everything that's going on, have a better understanding, make better decisions, make more money. Don't be fooled quite as much by things that seem surprising. So I, I just wish that, that people would, would learn probabilities at a younger age and we kind of carry some of those learnings through their lives. Thank you. So uh, that, that was it. We, we need to wrap this up. If, um, if people want to get in touch with you, want to follow you, where, where is the best uh, place to do that? Just Google my name. Uh, you know, there's, <laughs> I'm, 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 not, I'm never hiding and I, I'm just delighted. Not only can people find me, I encourage them to look. Love to connect on, on LinkedIn. Uh, and just, you know, as people have questions, as people have stories to tell, hopefully the good ones, the kinds of stories you've been telling, um, I love to hear them. I love to steal them. I love to share them with others because I think we, we all can learn from each other about best practices here. And I think, again, we've, we've made great progress, but I think the, the best is yet to come in terms of customer valuation. So it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure for me to talk to you and, I, and I'm happy to talk to everybody else. Excellent. Thanks a lot for being part of the CVO Live today, Professor Fader, and uh, all the best from Bucharest. My pleasure. Keep up the good work.